You guys hear me okay? Yeah. Yes. Perfect. All ready to get started. We got 42 people online. That's not too bad. What is this? This is the first lecture of week two, but it's really like week two and a half because we had a half a week to start with. 40 out of 50 something people online is not too bad. I bet if we were at WPI, there'd be fewer of you in the classroom. This is the moment where you laugh at my joke, right? No? Wasn't funny? I see somebody's laughing. He just ha, 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 ha. Ha, 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 ha. Good one. All right. Don't forget to get a shout out your name when you're laughing so I know who it is. Lucas. Lizinda. Zoe. Um, so... Griffin. <laughs> so you guys figured out we didn't do a quiz on Sunday? There wasn't a quiz posted anywhere. Yeah. I'm going to just say that if the quiz isn't live and available to you by midnight on Friday, there just won't be a quiz. So you don't have to keep looking after that. Um, and if, if the quiz is going to be canceled, I'll try to announce it in advance. Um, when I went to post the quiz, I wasn't certain that I liked all of the questions. And I, I all, well, I was certain that I didn't like all of the questions. And um, I wasn't certain that it was going to grade correctly. So I, uh, I spent all day Friday looking at the quiz, trying to make it better. And then by Friday night, I just gave up. I wasn't going to make it better, or at least I wasn't going to make it better enough that I wanted to share it with you guys. So, um, so I should have, I should have let you know that we weren't going to do that, but I figured that you'd all figure it out eventually. Um, I will roll the important learning content of that quiz into future quizzes as we go here, but we're not going to go back and do a makeup quiz or anything like that. Um, one of the, one of the reasons I wasn't certain I loved the content of the quiz <clears throat> was because you don't have that opportunity to be in the lab this term and to uh, to experience the changing of those process variables and, and what the output from the machine is when you change those. And so I wanted to spend a little bit more time today talking about the uh, the whole the process variables and the design parameters. Now we talked about last week, I think I put up a slide. I think it maybe was we had this presentation. And I had a, a series of slides here that we went through. I'm still sharing my screen, right? Okay, just checking. Um, and so we were talking about this, it's sort of a complex process. So the art, that's, that's what the designer has envisioned that they want for solving the customer's need. So before the designer does any of that, they should really determine what is the customer need. 
and uh, and then they should think, well, we have something that can solve that customer's need. But the um, it, it, we're going to focus right now on being manufacturing engineers. And, and so as we focus on being manufacturing engineers, we have to assume that. It is bad to do assume, right? We all we all know what what assuming things makes, but um, but we have to assume as manufacturing engineers that the thing we're making for the designer or for our customer is the thing that's going to solve the customer need. Um, maybe as you get more experience in this, and as you as you do more things, you may try to negotiate with the designer and say, hey. Um, You've got this really cool design here, but I don't think it solves the need that you think it solves. But that's not really your job as a manufacturing engineer. Your job as a manufacturing engineer is to figure out how to help the designer fulfill the thing that they thought of. And so we have this art thing that we talk about in this art to part. And the art is the design. It is the drawing, like the, the, we've, got a, we've got a drawing here. Um, if we had a solid model, it would be the solid model of the part. It would be any lists of design specifications that the designer has has put out there. You guys know what this part is. Um, let's do a quick thing in the raise your oh no, say yes if you have received your your kit yet from the bookstore. Just trying to figure out how many of those got yes. to people yet. Yes. Oh, I meant I meant to say yes. yes in the participants thing, but you could shout it out too. That's good. Yeah. Make it easy. It's easier to count. So I get five no's, 20, 30 yeses, 30 something yeses. Um, of the no's, uh, have you ordered it and just not received it yet, or have you not ordered it? I'm just curious. Somebody can speak up. I've ordered it, but I haven't received it yet. Okay. I right. ordered it, yeah. but also have not received it. Okay, yeah. Um, I know the person who lives like half a mile from the bookstore got hers the next day. But uh, if you live further away than half a mile from the bookstore, it may take longer to get to you. Uh, I think what we're going to do is we're going to start using the stuff in the kits next week just to make sure that everybody has a chance to receive that. Um, those of you that have received it, you'll note that there's glass inside. Try not to break the glass and hurt yourself. Um, you'll also note that we didn't give you assembly instructions. The assembly is pretty intuitive and you could probably figure it out without the instructions. Um, but I'm just gonna say, don't put the glass test tube, broken glass through your, the palm of your hand, because this is a bad week to go to the emergency room. Um, if you seem to be struggling sliding the uh, the glass test tube over the o-rings on the uh, on the cylinder don't push harder get um well and when you do it in the lab we make you wear leather gloves when you do that part but if you put a little uh dish soap or something on there it might slide on easier um we we did pretty much 100% inspection on the o-ring grooves so the, all the o-ring grooves should be the right depth we didn't inspect the test tubes. It's possible that some of them got made bigger or smaller. Uh, but uh, just, just be careful with that as you try to put it together. Uh, you'll note that there's three different cylinders in there and that there's a set of calipers in there, a, a, a thing of dowel pins and stuff. Um, we're going we're gonna to talk about using that stuff next week, um, just so that every, make sure everybody gets a chance to have it. But those of you that have it, you'll recognize this part, right? Can anybody uh, can anybody guess what the part does? So so the designer here when they when they made the part or when they designed the part they had an intent. So so what could somebody say what the intent of this part is? I don't know if my kit but is it the holder for the test tube? Uh, it's actually not the holder for the test tube, but you're pretty close. It's the holder for the cylinder. Oh, this would be really good if I had all of these parts and I could hold them up to the camera right now. Give me 25 seconds. Uh, 
I don't think he saw me, but I I was holding it while he was talking about it. I did not see you, but I could hear you because I got my ear thing in. All right. So let me switch over from stop sharing for a second here. Now you see me all big. So here is our, our thermoacoustic engine. And so the brass part here, we call that the cylinder. And so this piece here, the, uh, the one we're talking about in the drawing, we call it the Y block, mostly because it looks like a Y. Um, and there's a thing that we use for fixturing and manufacturing that we call a V block. And we use V blocks when we want to hold something that's round. Because if I have my V shape here, I could put something round in it and it locates it in the X, I guess this is the X direction, right? So it locates it. So if this V never moves, this thing never moves this way. And so, uh, so we could have made a V block, but that would have been boring. So we took a V block and we said, let's make it look like this so that the students can have another machining operation to do when they're machining the parts to, uh, to make their thermoacoustic engine. And so that's why it's a V block, sorry, it's why it's a Y block instead of a V block. But the purpose for the, the V part of it is to locate the round thing from moving in this direction. And then we put, if you see on the cylinder, we put these uh, we put these ridges on the cylinder that the strap can fit in. So the strap that goes over it, we put those in there, and that keeps it from moving in this direction. And so, what's the function of the of the Y block? Then, with that description. A mount slash stand. It's a mount slash stand. So I think those are words that we could use to describe it. Um, what's its function? So it is a mount. It is a stand. But what is it? What does any kind of a mount or any kind of a stand do? What is? What's the function? What's the intended? The so a function should start with a verb. Place. Say again. Raise. Holds in support. It it holds it. So what does it mean to hold something? Keep it where you want it. So it holds it. It's so it's holding it. So it's keeping it in place. Is it stabilizing them? So it's keeping it in place. So it's locating it. So location and resistance to force. And yes, I know I spelled resistance wrong, but I don't spell well. I are an engineer. So I don't care. All right. So, so the function of the Y block is to hold the cylinder at a location relative to the base. So the base is this bottom part here, right? So the function of that Y block is to hold the cylinder in a location and then to resist forces. What kind of forces do you think we have to resist with this part? Gravity. We gotta, we gotta resist gravity. So. If we made it out of a marshmallow, it would probably sag over time, right? So a marshmallow would be the wrong material to use. Um, if we made it out of wood, 
He probably could have made it out of wood. But the uh, the bit that goes right over here lights on fire. And I suppose we might catch the wood on fire and then it would sag over time or you know, turn into smoke and disappear. Um, so, but this live lock, it has a function. The function is to locate the cylinder at the right location. The cylinder has multiple functions. The cylinder has to, um, let's see, the cylinder has to be able to be located by the live lock. And so we put these two features on here. Am I, I'm not screen sharing, right? No. Do so you see the stuff I hold up to the camera? Okay. So we put these features here so that the cylinder won't go this way relative to the live lock. We put the strap to maintain forces so that it won't move because when the piston is moving in and out of the cylinder, try not to jam this one in. When that piston is moving out of the cylinder, does anybody watch the video of one of these running? I think we, we had a video somewhere that I shared. So that, that piston can oscillate back and forth at about a thousand cycles a minute if it's, if it's tuned just correctly. So as that vibrates back and forth, it makes the whole thing shake. And so if you just let that happen, this would fall off the, the fixture. So there's a strap that holds that in place. In the Y block, there's two machine holes. Let me go back to the screen sharing. If I can figure out the controls. <clears throat> so we have two machine holes here that have threads cut into them. The purpose of that is to hold down the, to hold down the strap that holds the cylinder in place. So there's a lot of features on this drawing in the art here that have a true function. There's a reason for that feature to be there and there's a reason for the tolerances on those features. And we're gonna talk about tolerances later in the class. But, uh, but a tolerance is basically how much the designer is willing to let the manufacturer screw up when they're making the part. And so um, it gives us the ability to actually make things. All right, so we've got our art. Our art is described by the drawing, by the solid model, by lists of specifications that we may be getting in the part. Now, in order, oh, and our thermoacoustic engine, this is more than one part, right? Um, I've got my test tube and steel wool here. I've got, so that's two parts. I've got two rings, that's four parts. I've got one, two, three fasteners. Three plus four is seven parts. I've got a piston that just fell out and landed on the floor and bounced, that's eight parts. I've got the cylinder, that's nine. The strap, that's 10. Y block is 11. Base is 12. So this is an assembly made out of 12 parts. Some of them we manufacture and some of them we purchase. So our whole assembly has to function together also. But for each part, let's just consider each individual part that we're manufacturing. And since the drawing that we're looking at is of the Y block, let's consider the Y block. So if we're gonna make this part First, should we use a milling machine or a lathe? Should we do a milling or a turning exercise milling. to make this part? So I heard somebody say milling. Does anybody want to turn it in a lathe? Nobody wants to turn it in a lathe, no brave souls. You wouldn't be able to do all of it in the lathe. You wouldn't be able to do all of it in a standard two axis lathe, I agree. Um, if you have a lathe that does, um, a lathe that can do three axis machining in addition to turning, and so that would be, I don't know if you really call it a lathe anymore. Maybe it's a, uh, yeah, well, we tend to call it a Y-axis lathe with live tooling, so we, we do still call it a lathe, but it's really a combination of a milling machine and a lathe that is put in one package. Um, so you could do this all in a machine that involves some turning, but really this part is a prismatic part.
part. So we're going to cut it in a milling machine. Um, if I want to make this part in the milling machine, how many times do I have to put the workpiece material in the machine? So our, our first step in our flow here was to decide our process. And so we decided our process, right? We identified the features. Identifying those features allowed us to decide the process that we're going to use. Uh, to make this part, though, how many times do I have to put it in the machine? Twice. You definitely have to. All right, you definitely have to put it in the machine once, right? Otherwise, we wouldn't say we're making it in the machine. So we have to put it in the machine once. If we put it in the machine twice, can we make all the features that are shown in the drawing? Maybe three times. So I heard I heard a vote for three times and a vote for two times. Let's go back to participants. I'm liking this participants thing. Uh, if I can only find the button. Participants. All right, so I can clear all the yeses and nos, I think. Clear all, got it. All right, so say yes if you think it's two times and say no if you think it's three times. This is almost as cool as making you stand up and then making you move to different sides of the room, which is what I would have done if we'd been in the classroom. All right, everybody stand up. Go to the left side of your room if you think it's one. No, I wouldn't be able to see who went off camera in which direction. Um, all right, so what was yes again? Two. Was yes, yes two times? Two. Yes is two times. So you definitely have to put it in the machine two times. You could put it in the machine three times. Somebody that said three times, describe to me the process that you would use. Describe um, it to me and I'm going to describe it to me and I'm going to try to write it on draw it on the board as you say it. Assuming that it's just like a rectangular piece of stock. Um, All right. So probably, I've got a rectangular piece of stock. Um, the part that's at the top, that's where the, the V block is. You probably uh, mill that first and then use that to okay. hold the piece and then do so the Y part. Mill that first, describe the operation. Um. Like going when around. It, um, the, uh... When I put it, let me see. I got a, all right, this is like a rectangle, right? When I put it in the machine, if we assume that Z is this direction, so the spindle's coming down from the ceiling, would I put it in the machine this way or this way or this way? Oh, uh, the second way? This way. Yeah. Okay. And then how would the tool move relative to the workpiece? It would like circle gonna... that top part to make the the rounded part of that V block, since looking at the top okay. of the V block is like rounded. Okay, so I'm going to put it to if I draw here the top down view of our piece in the milling machine, then I would have my cutter. I'll use green for the tool. I have my cutter move around like this. To make those features? Yeah. That's what you mean? Okay. All right. I like that. And then what else would I do when it's in this orientation? Um, the blind holes for the mounting holes for the bracket. All right. So I would drill and tap these holes right here for the bracket when it's in this orientation. Would I do anything else when it's in this orientation? I wouldn't think so, no. Okay. What would I do next? Um, flip it on the long side and then machine the, uh, the so actual V bracket so part. So the top down view now looks like this. And this is the surface that I just made. So this is the surface that I just made. I've got my holes here that we drilled and tapped. Right, and this is round here, so I guess I got to draw another line there. Is that what you mean? Yeah, and then machine the V block part there. 
All right, and then I would have my my milling tool come in here and make this shape by coming in like that. Yeah. Okay. And then what would I do next? Um, the little bit that was machined at the V block, grip it by that, and then turn it upright and machine the like the uh, the stem or whatever you're gonna call it. So the next thing I'm gonna do, if I do a side view of the vise, it might be easier to show what we're talking about here. So there's the vise jaw, there's the vise body, there's the other vise jaw, there's the other part of the vise body. And so in the vise, this part moves back and forth like this. And so it can close and we'll put some little parallels down here. So we have something for our part to sit on. And then we would take that bit that we already machined and put it in like this. Yeah. And then if I then look at the, so this is the end view. So that's the side view. This is, would be the end view. What I see there is something like this. And then how would I make the Y shape? Uh, I would assume like starting from the top, just going all the way around that so it's uh, actually, stem. It's 100% the way we do it. We actually come in with a tool that's basically shaped like this. Got a, a radius here and a radius here, flat on the bottom. And that tool, we spiral around the part going down and out as the tool goes down. And each time it goes around the part, it's removing a little bit of material. And so after so I've got my piece here, after the first time it has gone around, My piece looks like this, and this is where the bottom edge of the tool went. And then I step down again, and I make another bit here. The tool comes out. I step down again, and the tool goes out a little bit more, and I step down again, and the tool goes out a little bit more, and I step down again. And we spiral down and around the part. And so that's why when you look at the surface of this Y block, I can see down my, my phone, when you look at the surface, you see these ridges that come down along, I guess I should do it in the orientation we're cutting it. You see these ridges that come down along the edge of the part. Each one of those ridges indicates another step down. And so we get a fairly rough surface on that outside edge of the part, right? What would we do if we wanted to have a smoother surface there? What if we cared about that surface finish? Make the depth of cut smaller. Could you we make the depth of cut smaller. Now, each one of those little bumps, those little ridges, and if we draw it, it's really easier to see. I'm just gonna look, I'm just gonna draw one side. So each one of those little ridges there, it has a distance from here to here, and that we control by changing the depth of cut. It also has a radius at the bottom. What controls that radius? How far the, the drill moves from every rotation, like how much- How far it steps over, you mean? How yes. It steps sideways? Yeah. yeah, and so that that stepping sideways will impact how big we go. It'll it, so this distance may stay the same, but if we step sideways, we'd get more of this. But the radius itself, what controls the radius? The drill bit. The, the 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 radius on the edge of the tool is what controls that radius right there. And so as you step down, 
You need to you need to think about what's the radius of the of the corner of the tool. And so if we were using an end mill that had a sharp corner here, we would get a bunch of little steps down the part. We're using a bulldoze end mill when we make this. So a bulldoze end mill, instead of having a sharp corner there, has a radius there. And so because we have that radius, we get these little scallops instead of the steps. So if we want to make these heights closer together, we can change that depth of cut. Actually, in a spree, there's a, and, and you'll see this when you go to, um, in two or three weeks, when you go to do the programming to make the Y block, you'll see that there's a button in a spree where you can control the scallop height. And so that scallop height would be this distance here. You can control the scallop height and you can set a tolerance there and a spree will calculate how much to make the depth of cut for each pass based on the scallop height and the radius on the edge of the tool. Um, all right, so if we care about that surface finish, we can decrease the depth of cut. What does decreasing the depth of cut do to us? It's the time. Make it less um, pixelated looking? It will make it less pixelated looking. In fact, you could make it, you could almost make it look like a mirrored finish. You could make it so smooth that you wouldn't feel that it was pixelated at all, um, but it would take a long time. So every time you reduce that, that depth of cut, it makes it take longer. One of our criteria for this part, and this is normally the first thing that you make when you go in the lab, is you go in and you run this part in front of the machine. So how long do you think it takes us to make one of these Y blocks? For, oh, and um, we used to make it in three steps the way we described here. Last year, we changed the process and we do it in two steps now. Um, and we can talk about how to do it in two steps instead of three steps. But that three-step process, if you showed me this part and said, I need you to make 50 of these parts, I would use that three-step process because it's the simplest one to program, and it, it's really easy to set up and fixture. So the three-step process. But how long do you think it takes to make one of these Y blocks? Maybe 15, 20 minutes. Somebody said 15 minutes. Um, anybody think it takes longer than 15 minutes? Maybe like 30 minutes. Somebody said 30 minutes. And we think it takes less than 15 minutes. Now keep in mind that we made 90 of them in 86 hours, but we also made all the other components for your Sterling engine and bought the boxes and put them in the boxes and made the packaging material and got them over to the bookstore. Probably five time. minutes then. <laughs> Somebody said five minutes. And so uh, so five minutes-ish of machine time. I think the machine time is about six minutes total to make one of these Y blocks with the parameters that we're using, with that step down that we're using. But we can, um, was it five? Yeah, it's more like eight minutes of machine time with the with the parameters that we have but we can get a part off the machine every four minutes. And the way we get a part off the machine every four minutes is we run two machines at the same time. One machine is doing the first operation, the other machine is doing the second operation. And every four minutes, a new part comes off the machine. And that time between parts coming out of the, of the production line, we call that the tack time. So that's the medium, the mean time between parts coming out of the process. And so our process there involves two machines, actually three machines, because there's a bandsaw. We have to cut the stock material to shape also, put it in the machine. And each, the, uh, each of the machining processes, so the milling process to make side one and side two takes about four minutes. We can do it in about two and a half minutes. But... 
not in the machines that we use in the lab. To do it in about two and a half minutes, you have to use a machine tool that has a lot more horsepower. Um, and that's what we normally do when you guys come to lab, is we do it in the machine with a lot more horsepower and in, in the tack time is about two and a half minutes. And um, your first day in lab, you get to experience chips flying at the glass that's between you and the workpiece. And it sounds like a machine gun is shooting the chips at the glass. And so that's one of the things that you missed by doing the online version of the class is you didn't get to have the machine gun fire of chips flying at your face. Um, it's also important that we fixture the part correctly when we, uh, when we do it that way. And we actually use a torque wrench to, uh, to tighten the vise. And we've found that when people forget to use the torque wrench to tighten the vise, the workpiece comes out of the fixture and it breaks the glass. And so that's no fun either. So, all right, so we've got, we've got our functional parameters of the location of the holes, the shape. What's the function of that Y shape? To, to fix the cylinder in the direction. The V part, the V part at the top, let me share. To make it more interesting? So the V part here, that function is to locate the cylinder. These holes are to allow the screws to hold the clamp down. This hole down here is to allow us to locate it on the base based on the, the mating feature on the base. The function of the Y, somebody said it, is to make it look cooler. I like so that. So that the Y part of it is totally aesthetic. It has no function other than the G whiz factor of, oh man, doesn't that look cool? And we wanted to have a part for you to work on that did three axis milling. And we didn't need to do any three axis milling to make this part until we got to the Y shape. So that was the other function of the Y in our, uh, in our part here. Okay, so we've got functions, we've got design parameters. So the design parameters are things like in the drawing here where it says two of this 0 .0, 0 0.201 through all quarter 20 UNC through all. So we drill a hole at 2.01 inches in diameter and we tap the hole with a quarter 20 um, UNC thread. And so those are things that the, uh, that the designer tells us. What are the process variables? So those are design parameters, those are DPs. What, what are the process variables of, uh, let's say, uh, Let's say for making the feature, turn on laser pointer. Oh, cool. Can you guys see the laser pointer thing? Yes. Sweet. So what are the process variables that allow us to make this hole? Oh, can't see me anymore because my camera timed out. So what are the process variables that allow us to make this hole? We should say feed, speed, and depth of cut, right? Actually, do we have depth of cut with a drill? Can you guys still hear me? I can't hear anybody. Yes. I can hear you, yeah. Okay. Okay, just nobody was talking back. When I ask you a question, I expect somebody to talk back. I get nervous when I can't hear you. Uh, so what are the process variables that allow us to make this hole? The speed of the cutter. All right, so we need the speed. When we do a drilling operation, um, what, how, how do we define speed? Uh, ro Our, rotation, RPM. So we could, we could call it RPM. So that's rotations per minute. We could also talk about, so where does the cutting happen in a drilling operation? The cutting edge? It happens at the cutting edge. And so if we're looking, and I'm not sharing the screen right now so you can see what I'm drawing on the board. So if we zoom in on the end of the drill and we're looking at it, we get, there's like a, a chisel tip here. 
and we're using two flute drills. So there's another one that's over here. And then from here, there's a spiral. And so if we're looking at the tip of the drill, the cutting edge is really this edge right here. And, and there's two of them on our drill. So there's two of these edges that are spinning around. That's the cutting edge, right? What do the flutes do, the spiral that goes up the side of the drill? What's the function of that? It helps the material come out. The entire function of those spirals that go up the side of the drill is to pull the chips up out of the hole. So if we didn't need to get the chips out of the hole, we wouldn't need to have those spirals. And so those are intended to like, it basically it works kind of like a pump, is pumping the chips up out of the hole. If we're really worried about pumping the chips up out of the hole, what we do here on the flat behind the, uh, the cutting edge is we could put holes that go through that spiral all the way up and we can pump coolants down so that the coolant comes out of the bottom of the drill. And that's really kind of cool. And it's really expensive to make the tool. But um, let's just think about this drill. So what cuts the material is the surface speed. It's the speed of the cutting edge moving through the workpiece material. So what's the speed here? So it's RPM is our angular velocity, right? So we've got some RPM that's spinning our drill. But what's the speed here on the cutting edge? It's going to be the we're going to have to use the circumference, and then we're going to have to have pi times diameter. That gets us the circumference. So that's how far this goes around for each revolution, and then what? Convert that to feet, or we do we do actually convert it to feet because for some reason when we talk about uh, when we talk about speed as surface speed. The units are feet per minute. And so we've got to convert. And when we talk about a drill that's 0.2 inches in diameter, we always talk about inches. We don't say it's what's 0.2 inches in feet. I don't know, you're going to divide by 12, right? Very small. Um, so we've got to convert uh, pi times diameter to feet. And so how do I do that? This is inches per rev. So pi times diameter is inches per rev. I need feet per minute. So to go from inches per rev to feet per minute, I got what 12 inches per foot. And so if I divide this by 12, I end up with units of feet per revolution. How do we go from feet per revolution to feet per minute. Multiply by RPM. Multiply by RPM. And that's in inches, uh, so rev per min. We multiply by revolutions per minute, we end up with feet per minute. Okay, so if our drill is point our, our drill, it says here, is 0.2 inches. So 0.2 inches, somebody got to oh, wait. I always do this. I say, hey, somebody in the classroom, use your calculator and tell me the answers. But I have a calculator. So let's see. Share the screen. Share. All right. So I have a calculator. So 0.2, 0.2. Two times pi three point one four, right? So that's pi times diameter. I'm going to divide by twelve. Divide by twelve, and now I want to multiply by RPM. How fast should my drill go? I don't know. If I wanted to know how fast to spin the drill, what should I do? 
Is there a table? Uh, because it matter. It depends on the material, right? It depends on the material. It depends on. WPI real feed speed. Well, look at that. The WPI Manufacturing Labs webpage has a has a reference for this. We're using a drill, right? Drill feeds and speeds. How big is our drill? Point two. Anybody inches remember? In point two inches in diameter. Point two inches. That's pretty close to a quarter of an inch, right? Yeah. Yeah. All right. So, uh, anybody know what the workpiece material is? Ooh, 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 ooh. It's low silicon. It's low silicon aluminum. It's number N two over here. So I go from N two. So my surface speed. That's what I'm looking for first, right? If I have a normal uncoated drill, I want to go 225 feet per minute. I want to go 225 feet per minute. What do my RPMs need to be? So that's taking this problem and solving it in the other direction, right? So if I, I've got 225 feet per minute service speed, but I've got to tell the machine what RPM to spin the spindle. What do I do? Multiply by 12 and then divide by pi times the diameter. 225 times 12, 10. 12 divided by pi times the diameter. Is that correct? How do we know if it's correct? Check the units. Check the units. All right, so I get feet per minute times feet, or sorry, inches per foot, feet per foot divided by inches per rev. Um, so feet go away. I get inches per minute divided by inches per rev, but I could do rev per inch times instead. And then I get inches go away, I get rev per minute. All right, so units work, the answer must be correct. Use engineering's math, just a bunch of word problems, cancel the units. All right, so what is this? Anybody do the math yet? Do we need to go back to the calculator? So 225 times 12? So 2700 divided by was 3.14 times 0 0.201, 0 0.63 something, one. Four thousand two hundred seventy eight. Point nine two two three four five RPM. So that's a process variable that we have figured out. Do I need that much precision? No. 
Would you be okay if I said 4,000? No. So I need more precision than this, but less than this. Actually, 4,000 is probably close enough. But, but 4,200, 4,300 is probably more accurate. Um, these numbers, again, when we go to our chart, I'm still screen sharing, right? Yes, I'm still screen sharing. When we go to our chart, this number here is not set in stone. It's, it's an idea based on what people have experienced in the past using this kind of tool and this kind of material. Again, um, when we go to figure out our feed rate, so our drill is a little bit smaller than a quarter inch, it's bigger than an eighth inch. So we could come over here in the chart, it's somewhere between 0 0.005 inches per revolution and 0 0.006 inches per revolution. So our feed rate is somewhere in that range. We could do a linear interpolation, right? And we could interpolate the answer and you guys all know how to do that. Or we could look at the chart and say, well, it's a little bit closer to a quarter than it is to an eighth. So maybe we'll do five, nine. Or maybe we'll do five, eight. And so you can use some engineering judgment when you do this. Now, take my engineering judgment with a grain of salt. Who has engineering judgment? Who has engineering judgment? Engineers. Engineers have engineering judgment. Are you guys engineers? Yes. Absolutely. What's the value of engineering judgment? I'll sell it for twenty nine ninety nine. Mine's thirty four ninety nine. Well, that's your cost for engineering judgment, and so that that would sort of be your consulting rate. And um, and I think you guys are underselling yourselves. I think you're worth more than that as a consulting rate. Um, in fact, I'll, I'll give you one short life lesson before we go away because it's time to end the call. But um, if you decide that you want to be a consultant and you want to make your living as a consultant, there's a very quick way to determine what your, your daily rate for consulting should be. First, decide how much money you want to make. Because how much money you want to make is a determining factor in what your consulting rate should be. So say I want to make $100,000 a year. If I say I want to make $100,000 a year, I can divide 100 by 50. And so 100 divided by 50 is what, two? Yes. So that's $2,000. $2,000 is then your daily rate. Because you have to assume that out of every week, you spend four days trying to sell one day. And then you've got to actually be able to deliver $2,000 a day worth of value to your customers to get hired a second time. So that's how you decide your, your, your consulting daily rate. Um, so uh, what's going on? Okay, so lab. Uh, in lab, the Esprit licenses that we got don't post code. So if you haven't already gone past that step, when you get to the step that says post code, just skip over it, look at the rest of the instructions and move on to the next thing. I don't want to get hung up with that by asking Esprit to again issue us a new license that does post code. Everything else should work fine. And this, that uh, first exercise was the only thing that required us to, to post code. Everything else we're going to do, um, you won't need to post the code. So we'll go on from that. Um, continuing labs, I haven't yet decided what I want you to do in the Learn CNC. I'm gonna look through that and I will update it. But I do have the, uh, the week two schedule updated. If you wanna go back and look at what we did in week one, <laughs> week one you can just go back and some, somewhere here, we can look at the other slides. So week one is back here, week zero is back here. Um, but week two is up here. Uh, I, I crossed the quiz off we're going to have a discussion post for wednesday what should we post about the discussion forum this week I know. We're gonna have a ice cream. yeah i know 
I mean, you can post about that if you want to start your own thread, uh, but that that won't be graded. Uh, we're going to post about um, about quality in manufacturing, and uh, and for Wednesday, so for Wednesday evening or actually before lecture on Thursday is soon enough. I'll put the I'll put the due date to be just before lecture starts on Thursday. Um, I want you to post what's the meaning of quality in manufacturing. And how do you know when you have it? So this will be the discussion forum post for this week. It'll be due Thursday at 11 a.m. And I'll, I'll put that in uh, in Canvas as soon as we're done with the call. Does that make sense to everybody? What's quality in manufacturing and how do you know when you have, oh, you can't see it, I'm still screen sharing. I'll stop the screen sharing, now you can see the picture. Um, and uh, we'll see you in lab or we'll see you back here on Thursday. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you.